19 books? Yeah, it's it's not terrible. It's coming back to me now. Half baked. <laughs> All over the place right now. I enjoyed it. It was it was strange. Sorry, this video is so late. Um, I didn't want to be filming videos around the holidays, so we're doing some catch up. We are doing today my December wrap up, and I read quite a bit in December. Um, my final count for the year was 210 books, um, some of which I read twice, um, like within the same year. Anyway, um, in my stack right now, I have 19 books. So yeah, we're let's go go through them all. Last wrap up for 2022 this deck's gonna fall. Let's do this. First book that I read in December was Lolly Willows by Sylvia Townsend Warner, which I got from Book of the Month for uh, quite some time ago. I was trying to read, I'm always trying to catch up on my Book of the Month backlist, but also um, I was trying to, some of them I've had for so long that they don't count towards your reading challenge in Book of the Month. Um, they only like let the previous year or like half of the previous year count. I don't know. Anyway, I was trying to read all the ones that were like about to not count anymore in the following year. I didn't get through all of them. Lolly Willows is one of those. It's also quite short. And this, I believe, has the honor of being the very, very first book of the month club book that was ever picked. Yeah, 1926, our first selection. I don't know, does book of the month didn't exist in 1926. So I don't exactly know what that means. Maybe it means it's the oldest book they've ever included. Okay, no, it, yeah. April 1926, Book of the Month Club announced its first ever selection, Lolly Willows, by debut author Sylvia Townsend Warner. All right. Well, I did not know Book of the Month Club existed in any form for that long. Dang. Any hoosies. Yeah, I hadn't really heard of this book until I saw it on Book of the Month and I got it a long time ago as an add-on. I just, I mainly liked the cover and then the description of it sounded pretty interesting. And, you know, it's apparently something of a classic. It's about a young woman, a young unmarried woman, who, like, goes to live in the countryside because she refuses to get married or to like go by society's norms. Uh, it's quite a quirky little book. Um, the thing that it most reminded me of just in like the tone of it um, was We Have Always Lived in the Castle. The story is quite different. But so she like lives in the countryside and, and she's kind of like a, her way of thinking <laughs> is not just, you know, like modern for its day, so feminist. It's actually not. I mean, it is in a way, but it's mostly that she just kind of like doesn't think the same way that other people do. I'm not entirely sure if it, it should be interpreted as her being somewhat not neurodivergent. It kind of reads like that. So I, I, I don't know. And I don't really think we had the vernacular for that when this was written. But in, in any case, she just kind of like does her own thing, goes her own way and has her own way of thinking. And it and I, I thought based on the cover and the blurb, it sounded, you know, like she would go in and, and do witchcraft in the countryside. And she kind of does, but like not, at all in the way that you would think. <laughs> like it, it's a very quirky, strange little book. And it's more just like the experience of kind of being in Lolly's mind. Although it's it's not in first person, but it's just kind of like following her and a lot of things, um, it's not really magical. I guess it might, maybe it would be considered magical realism. Cause it, it sort of feels like it's magical only insofar as like Lolly's interpretation of the world is a bit different. <laughs> I enjoyed it. It was it was strange, unique. I haven't read anything like it. And it's very funny. But in that kind of like, you know, when you read older books, when you read classics, when you read Jane Austen, things like that, where like it has a lot of like social commentary and humor in a way that like you kind of have to pay attention to catch it. But I, I definitely chuckled a lot while reading this. Um, there are some very amusing bits in the narration. So I would recommend it. It's older. It's not like a page turner or anything. And if you're expecting like a story of like witchcraft, like it isn't really. <laughs> But I did enjoy it. I did. Um, and I would recommend it. Uh, the next two we'll do together. <laughs> um, so for the Under the Northern Sky read along, our schedule is kind of like all over the place right now. In theory, we were supposed to read The Spider in December and then The Cuckoo in January. Um, but everyone else is behind and I'm way ahead. So no one's actually, I think Alex is the only one that's like on track. <laughs> uh, like actually I was like abiding by the original schedule. So I did read The Spider. Um, well, because, well, I was going to read The Spider in December anyway, per the schedule, but then I contacted Leo Carew about doing an interview. I thought it would take some time to schedule it, but he was like, sure, he like, how's next week? <laughs> and I was like, oh. So I was like, well, let me just go ahead and finish reading The Spider and also immediately read The Cuckoo so that I've read them before I interview him. And then Alan is extremely angry with me for doing that. Um, everyone is surprised. So anyway, um, very early in December, I like marathoned these books. I read The Cuckoo in like two days, partially because of the need to finish it before speaking with Leo Carew, but 
I would have, I think, probably read it very, very quickly regardless because it was such a page turner. I, the cuckoo is so good. I love it so much. It's, uh, I already love these books, but the cuckoo, I, I was in, I, honestly in such a reading slump after finishing it. Um, because I just, it just like nothing else could be the cuckoo, you know, I had finished that book and I was just like any other book I would pick up. I'm just like, ugh, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you follow the cuckoo? <laughs> so, um, and needless to say, five out of five stars loved it. I mean, the spiders are reread, loved it. Um, and I, if you haven't seen it and if you're interested, I'll leave a link down below the interview I did, which I have now already posted um, with Leo Carew. I, I would imagine this book will be pretty polarizing for people who haven't read it yet that are going to. Um, I loved it. I really, really loved it. Um, so yeah, I don't want to say too much about it because I mean, there's the interview with Leo Carew where we did talk about the whole trilogy. And at some point, as the read along makes its snail's pace towards the finish line, we will all be talking about the spider and the cuckoo at some point soonish. Uh, so you will hear my full thoughts about these books. And then I do think I want to do um, a like, should you read it for the Under the Northern Sky series type video to kind of like wrap up the whole thing. I have individual reviews for the wolf and the spider. I might do an individual re review for the cuckoo to like talk full spoilers. I'm not sure yet. Anyway, I don't want to say too much here other than that I loved it because I, I will, I have and I will already uh, be having other reasons and opportunities to talk about it at length. Um, but anyway, amazing. Love it. Love it. Love it. Next up, I read The Betrayals by uh, Bridget Collins. So I randomly read The Binding last month, uh, or, or I mean, in November. Um, and I talked about how I picked up The Binding because someone had sent me The Betrayals in this beautiful special edition. And I was like, well, I have The Binding. I should probably freaking read The Binding um, before I touch the new one. And if you saw my wrap up, um, I really, really liked The Binding. I really, really did. So I was like, well, hot diggity. <laughs> Let's read The Betrayals. So I did read The Betrayals. Um, now I like The Binding better than The Betrayals, but I did enjoy The Betrayals. And I do like this author's writing style. There is a twist in this book that I did not, I, I, it's, I, I can't say I saw it coming. I saw something coming. Like I, it seemed to me a twist was um, imminent or um, forthcoming, but it wasn't what I thought it would be. I thought we were going somewhere differently with it. I was like, ah, I think I've guessed it. I think what's going to be revealed is going to be this. And then I was right that something was amiss, that something would be revealed. And I was on the right track to some degree, but I was wrong ultimately about what the twist is. And I don't exactly know how I feel about the twist. I don't hate it. I don't like, it didn't like ruin the book for me. I just, I feel, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And then the book itself, it took me a while to realize that it was never going to explain itself. Um, and I believe there's a work that this book is inspired by that does something similar. Um, and it, I don't recall what the name of that book is. And I have not read that book either. So that would not have helped really to know that. I learned that after the fact, but it was inspired by another book that does something similar. So throughout this book, this again, it kind of like the binding, it feels like um, historical fiction, but it isn't actually. It's some alternate universe that feels vaguely like we're in England, um, that vaguely we're at like, you know, a Cambridge or Oxford type of place. Um, so I would almost count this book as like a dark academia book because it feels kind of like dark academia. And we're obsessed with this thing called the Grand Jeu. Um, like the great game. And it, the book never really explains what that is. <laughs> Everyone's obsessed with it. And they talk about, it's amazing how, to watch this author write so many scenes where people debate the intricacies of what makes the grand jeu like good or successful or, or brilliant while never actually explaining what the grand jeu is, which is like, I kind of the, not the point of the book, but like, I guess the point of the book is um, it's irrelevant what the game is, if that makes sense. Like, while it's a book about this game and everyone obsessed with this game, the ramifications of that, it's immaterial what that game actually is. And so that's why, I mean, I feel like the book doesn't actually explain it because that's not the point. Um, so we're not here to like go into the intro. It's almost kind of, it's like I complained about Babel, hated Babel. Um, and Babel goes on and on and on about the intricacies and details of the translation magic system. And I was like, but that's like, if this book is meant to be a metaphor about the power of translation, stop giving me intricacies about this stupid magic system because this magic system is stupid. Here, this book would really suck, I think, if we went to all this, like, the mechanics and intricacies of the rules of the Grand Jeu. That would ruin it because, like, that's not the point of this story. That's not the point of what's going on. Um, it is incidental to it or, like, it is, yeah, like, the, the Grand Jeu, like, the fact of it is important. You don't need to know how it works to read the story. 
I did see some criticism of people being like mad that he keeps talking about the Grand Jew and never explaining it. And I mean, at first I found it a little bit frustrating because I kept thinking it was going to explain it. But when I realized that that was not going to happen and that was not the point of the book, I stopped expecting it or waiting for it. And I could just like go along for the ride. Um, but if that's going to bother you, <laughs> then I definitely don't recommend you read this. Because if you're going to sit there and get angry that it's not explaining the Grand Jew, you will be very, very angry by the time you finish this book. So I enjoyed it. I, I think the binding is better. But this, ha this had a page turning and very haunting quality to it. And I do think if you like dark academia, this is very dark academia-esque. The next book that I read was Blood of Dragons by Robin Hobb. This is the fourth and final book in the Rainwald Chronicles. And um, Mara and I will be having our uh, Realm of the Elderlings Road So Far Rainwild Chronicles live chat um, on the 21st, I believe. So stay tuned for that. Come chat with us, especially if you've been reading a half read the realm of the elderlings um because it will be spoilery for the road so far um i certainly do agree that the rainwild chronicles is the weakest series within this series of series but it's a hob series so it's still miles away better than like most other books and series out there so while it is something of a low point i, I would agree that it is the weakest i just think people do overstate that a bit um i expected it to be like a really like mega low point and it is the weakest, <laughs> but it's not like, oh my God, who even wrote this? Like, where is Hob? Like, what is this crap? Which is kind of the vibe that I get from people who talk about it being the weakest one. Like, it's, it doesn't, yeah, I feel like the way people talk about it, it's like, like Realm of the Elderlings is like top shelf God tier, except for that dip where it's like utter crap for Rainwell Chronicles. Too bad. Like, I think I've seen people say, just skip it. It's, it, that's just like too extreme. Like, I, I do think it's the weakest. I do. I'm not going to lie. But yeah. Anyway, so I'll talk about it obviously at length. I think Mara feels a little bit differently about it um, than I do, um, but we generally agree about Hob. It's more like degrees of like, like we agree like th that we like things and dislike things and love characters and hate characters. It's just like how much more something will bother one of us or how much more one of us will be like invested in or loving something. So we tended to like generally agree. It's a, it's a matter of degrees of feeling for certain things. So I think we feel fairly similarly about the realm of the, uh, I'm sorry, the um, Rainwald Chronicles, but I think Mara likes it a bit better than I do. Um, so anyway, I look forward to speaking with Mara about it and having you all join us to chat about it. The next book I read was The It Girl by Ruth Ware. It was a buddy read with a couple of my patrons because I expressed a great love for Turn of the Screw, Turn of the Screw, yes. No, Turn of the Key. Turn of the Key. Turn of the Screw is it, what it's retelling. And uh, they had recently, or had in general read some Ruth Ware and liked it, uh, liked her books. Um, and so we wanted to read a Ruth Ware together. So It Girl, I believe is her absolute newest. So we we're like, why not that? And um, I didn't really like it. I think the, yeah, it's, it's not terrible, but it was pretty dumb. <laughs> and like, yeah, I, none of us really liked it that much. It's, I don't think we would say this is a favorite Ruth Ware. Turn of the Key is miles and away better. So unfortunately, this was a bit of a miss. Uh, the next th four, I'll just do really quickly together. Um, if, you, if you haven't seen it, I'll leave it linked down below, but I did a two-parter of Classics Vlog Project. The first was to reread favorites to see if they still are my favorite. Part two was to read um, classics I had not read before in the hope of finding a new favorite classic. So in December, because I wanted to finish that vlog project before the end of the year, so I like hurried up and finished what I had left to do on that DVR. Um, so I'll leave the vlog link down below where I talk about these books in, at length. But um, the four books I read in December for that vlog project were, uh, I didn't, I kind of read them back to back, but um, I just like put them all in my stack once I'd finished the last one. The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, uh, Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, and The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. So again, if you missed it and are interested, I'll leave the vlog where I talk about each of these books in depth down below. Uh, next up, I reread Ninth House by Lee Bardugo because the new, uh, the sequel, uh, Hellbent, is coming out this month, um, next in the second, second Tuesday, third Tuesday, <laughs> the third Tuesday of January, and I'm excited to read it. I, I didn't love Ninth House. It took me a long time to read it when it first came out, um, and I, in my original review of it, I um, talked about some things that I thought would have made it a stronger book and would have paced it better and uh, would have hooked the reader better. So I'm, I'm, this is far from being my favorite. I'm not, I don't love it, but I did quite enjoy Ninth House. And the second half I liked more than the first half and the ending did left, leave me wanting to know what would happen next. But Ninth House came out 
quite a while ago now. Um, and I read it not that long after it came out. So I figured I needed a refresher before reading Hellbent. And I'm glad I did because when I reread it now, I was like, oh dang, I forgot most of this. Uh, I like I remembered broad concept, broad strokes. And I remember the things that irritated me, which always stick out, I think, in our minds. Negativity sticks out in one's mind. So anyway, uh, yeah, I just reread it real quick um, before Hellbent. And I feel pretty much the same way about it the second time. Um, yeah, it's a... Uh, it's quite a harrowing read. Uh, trigger warnings abound if you have not read it, um, but I think it's pretty good. And I think if you're having trouble getting into it, I did too. Um, it's not guaranteed that you'll like it, but I did end up liking it. So if you're having trouble with the beginning, maybe push through, but or no, or don't. You know, there's, there's there's lots of books out there in the world. No reason to force yourself to read something you don't want to read. Uh, next up, I read uh, La Belle Sauvage. I think that's how it's pronounced, which is the first book in the Book of Dust. And um, I read this because... Well, for two reasons, I guess. One, um, my patrons and I are reading the His, His Dark Materials January through March, um, which is a reread for me. I have read His Dark Materials before. So it was kind of like wanting to get into the spirit of things. And I had had this book and The Secret Commonwealth for a long time. So I was like, it's about time I read it. But also the more like urgent reason was because I'm, I'm subscribed to the National Theater um, at home streaming um, uh whatever, whatever. I'm, I'm subscribed to that. I knew they had done a stage production of La Belle Sauvage, but it was only, I, I didn't realize it had been added to streaming. And so I was like, well, I really want to watch that. I better read the book really quick so that I can go watch the play version. So I did. I read it. I think I did it all in one day, or at least I finished the book and watched the play in one day. I may not have started the book the same day. I don't remember now. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was really fun being back in the world of His Dark Materials. And the His Dark Materials series, I really, really like the first book a lot. And then I think the series goes downhill after that. And I think the His Dark Materials series kind of stops being a story and just becomes about Philip Pullman's ideas by the end. So it was nice being in uh, reading La Belle Sauvage because it felt like we were back in the like Golden Compass Northern Lights era of like telling a story again. Um, so that was nice to be back in the world and not have it feel so weighed down by I guess soapboxing. It's not really soapboxing, I don't think, uh, to me, because soapboxing is like trying to convince you of a certain point. Um, I feel like the His Dark Materials books are more just kind of like wanting to examine and work through some ideas, and I can kind of just like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I did enjoy this very, very much, and I look forward to reading The Secret Commonwealth quite soon, but I believe he has not completed the Book of Dust trilogy yet. I think we're still waiting for book three. So anyway, next up, I read my uh, one of my book of the month club books. I did them back to back, actually. Uh, the first one I read was The Wilder Women by Ruth Emmy Lang. And this was a mega, mega disappointment. This was Ruth Emmy Lang's second book. I read um, their first book when it came out or shortly after it came out. It was gifted to me by a friend. It wasn't the sort of thing I would normally pick up. Uh, Beasts of Extraordinary Circumstance. And I really, really liked Beasts of Extraordinary Circumstance. So it's been, you know, many years now. Um, well, relatively many <laughs> George R. R. Martin still has more years between. Yeah, so this was this is as far this is just the um, the first book that Ruth Emmy Lang has written since writing *Beasts of Extraordinary Circumstance*, which was their debut. And I really liked the first book, so I expected pretty good things, especially if it doesn't feel kind of churned out. You know, that it's taken a few years to write another one. You know, good things come to those who wait. Quality over quantity. Blah 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 blah. So I, I had pretty high hopes for this when I was picking it for my book of the month club. I, I didn't really think about it. I was like, oh, Ruth Emmy Lang has a new book. I'm picking that. It was pretty terrible, to be honest. Um, it's really difficult for me to believe that this is the same author that wrote me Civic Extraordinary Circumstance. It didn't have any of the cleverness or charm or, I don't know, heartfelt character introspection. This felt so like surface level crappy, like a bad debut. So, I mean, I know this author is capable of better. I was just like, what happened? So I do not recommend this. I think I give this one star. It's not good as it like the plot isn't very good. The characterization's not very good. The like world building of this like sort of magical element that's to it is not good. We follow several characters and they all feel like I couldn't tell them apart for the entire book. It took me a while to even realize that we were following different characters. I was like, wait, hang on a minute. I thought we were following this character. But why are they, oh no, we're following two different characters, but they feel exactly the same. And the ending of it was like, I really, really hated this book, honestly. It's not just like, oh, it's kind of disappointing. I really, really hated it, so yikes. Uh, next, I read my other book of the month one book, um, and that was The Cloisters by Katie Hayes. And weirdly, um, What Are the Odds, another book that I read, it'll be like two down from this one. Um, it was a book where they mentioned The Cloisters, because uh, it's a real place. 
Um, anyway, this was, um, I don't know, they say it's, it's like a gothic mystery. I think that's how they pitch it. Thrills and chills. Yeah, I went into this expecting mystery, expecting possibly dark academia, blah, 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 blah. It's extremely forgettable, first of all. Right now I'm like, what was it about? It's coming back to me now. And it, it is, I, I guess it benefited from being read after Wilder Women, because this is not very good but it was better than Wilder Women, or at least more engaging than Wilder Women. This is another instance though, where kind of like the, the I don't know if I'd call it a twist, but like the answer to what's been going on, um, the ending of it is like not well done or set up and doesn't really work in my opinion. And I feel like the book didn't kind of know what it was trying to do or what it was trying to say or what it was trying to be. There, there is the kernel of something quite interesting here, but you would need to have done a lot better and more in-depth character work to make this like truly something interesting and juicy. This is too surface level to do that. And it ends up making everything feel kind of like two-dimensional and cardboard cut out and kind of like hammy and like you, you could do something quite similar to this and make it really, really good. And this just isn't it. So I felt like it had some decent atmosphere. The main character, it was, it's a decent hook to like get you wanting to follow this, but it ultimately kind of doesn't really go anywhere. And there isn't enough like character depth um, for the journey to make it worthwhile either. So I think this is a debut. So like I might consider reading more from this author if it being a debut is what made it so kind of weak. Cause there's potential here, but the execution falls quite flat. Uh, next up I read A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Banking by T. Kingfisher. This is my second T. Kingfisher of the year. I re loved my first T. Kingfisher, um, What Moves the Dead. And I, so I don't, I still want to continue reading more from T. Kingfisher, um, but I didn't really like this that much. This book claims to be YA, and I think it is too dark to be middle grade, but it reads more like middle grade, which is always kind of like disappointing to me. If something like feels more childish than it's supposed to be, because middle grade reading like middle grade is like fine. And you expect it to read like middle grade when you picked it up. This, this is sold as YA. I expect it to be a little bit more grown up, but it reads like alarmingly dark middle grade. A lot of the ideas that it's playing with, I feel like either, I don't, it's in this like weird limbo zone where I feel like you could get away with a story that's telling things this simply if you truly made it middle grade and really simplified it a bit more and made it a little bit more kiddy. But the ideas it's playing with, it's a little bit too mature for me to like, be able to brush away how, I don't know, how simply we handle some more complicated issues here. Because what's, I thought this would be, I picked it up because I thought it'd be a good around Christmas time. It has a freaking gingerbread man on the cover. Um, and a wizard's guide to defensive banking sounds like a good holiday read. So that's why I picked it up now. Um, I also, someone gifted me this copy of it and I was like, yeah, for Christmas time, I should read this immediately. It's not actually very Christmassy. <laughs> so I was wrong about that. It does have, it does strongly feature a gingerbread man. But like, yeah, I, I don't know how else to explain it. I feel like it, it's trying to, to tackle some some more some darker themes, some more adult issues, some socio political issues, and I just feel like it needed to like write an adult novel truly exploring these things, or write a much simpler middle grade novel where you can kind of hand wave it. Here, it's like it's too much to be a middle grade and not enough to be adult. And so the issues that it's like trying to handle, it just does them this massive disservice, I think, because it's, yeah, I don't know how else to say. It's it's done too much for you to be able to forgive how little it actually does. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's how I feel. I like the ideas behind it. I like how it's handling certain things. I like um, the way that magic works at first, because I think it's kind of whimsically done and humorously done. and. Um, this type of magic is pretty silly, so if it tried to handle this magic more seriously, it would not work for me. So I thought it did a good job of kind of, I've said before, doing magic that's like nonsense, but building in the understanding that it is kind of nonsense. But I feel like almost then this should be the, like making this just a simple kind of like murder mystery who done it with some funny magic would work, because that's kind of what the first half is. And if you wanted to do all of what it does in the second half with the more like socio-political stuff, then this needed to be better thought out and more fully fleshed out if you really want to tackle those things. So yeah, it just kind of feels half-baked. <laughs> I did not, uh, no pun intended, but um, yeah, kind of a letdown, but I will definitely read more from T. Kingfisher. Just, I don't, this just wasn't it for me, so. Uh, next up is a book that I don't have a physical copy of, and that is Debt of Bones by Terry Goodkind, um, which is our last book that we did read, have read, will be reading for our sort of truth read along. And the live show for it will be happening directly after this goes up, I believe. So it hasn't happened for me yet, but it will shortly happen. <laughs> and this was a prequel 
novella and I feel pretty meh about it. It wasn't the worst sort of truth book that I've read, but it was, eh, it was fine. So I don't know how much we'll have to say about it. I feel like for the live, uh, when we chat about the one that's for Dead of Bones, I think we'll just, it'll end up being kind of a retrospective on our sort of truth and journey. Um, just, I don't, I personally don't have that much to say about it other than like, it's a thing that I read and it wasn't terrible. So I know I'm really selling it for you, <laughs> but we'll have a good chat about sort of truth and Terry Goodkind as well as Dead of Bones. <laughs> uh, next up, I read the other book that mentions the cloisters, and that is The Toll by Neil Shusterman. I buddy read this with my, one of my patrons, um, and I also just generally kind of wanted, there was several series that I was like, I'm like one book away from finishing it. I would That would be cool to finish it in 2022. This is the only one <laughs> that I like actually did that with. I loved Thunderhead. I liked Scythe. It took me a long time to read Thunderhead. When I did, I was like, oh, this is so good. And then I was like ostensibly reading it with Mara and then like she didn't read Thunderhead and then I was like kind of waiting for her to read it before reading the toll and then that took so long that I just kind of forgot about it and stopped being a priority and then Mara did finally start reading Thunderhead and DNF'd it so I was like well shoot I better read the toll because there's no there's nothing to wait on or wait for and yeah I loved Thunderhead the toll not so much I did not hate it but this is too long and the sort of the conclusion and the where this has all been going, I did not like it very much. And the and it is just kind of like sprawling. And the, the pacing of this book is just dumb. It's so bad. And I don't know why it was done this way. And all these different perspectives of all these new different like kind of like fairly minor characters. I just I don't think that was necessary. Like the way this is done, I might forgive it if I was like, well, it was quite a slog at first because we're kind of all over the place, but ultimately I see why it was necessary to do that. I don't see why it was necessary to do that. I don't think it was necessary to do that. So while the Thunderhead was a page turner that I could not put down and I loved it, this I was like, I mean, it took me all month to read it. I started it in the beginning of December and I only barely finished it like before the end of the year. Yeah. I, I didn't care for this. It wasn't the worst thing I read. I think I gave it three stars because it wasn't awful, but definitely the weakest one in the trilogy in my opinion. And for the length, just nah. The second to last book that I read in December and in all of 2022 was The Sheep Farmer's Daughter by Elizabeth Moon. This is the first book in the Deed of Paxinary, and this was the book that my patrons chose for me to read and vlog for them, which I did. And um, this is a, a book that's been on the poll for me reading and vlogging basically since the beginning of my Patreon. <laughs> and it finally won. And um, the patron who suggested this for the poll um, was like, I mean, I suggested it early on. I would not suggest it now. It was like still on the poll from when that had taken place. Um, they're like, I, I know your taste better now and I would not have chosen this for you. Cause yeah, I didn't really like it. Yeah, <laughs> I quite disliked it, which is unfortunate. Um, but uh, that's the way it goes. And the last book that I read in December and in all of 2022 was the book that my patrons chose for us to read as our buddy read in December. And that was The Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien. And I enjoyed it. I don't think it's that fun to read, but I think it's incredibly impressive. And it was more fun to read than I thought it would be. I went into it going like, I expect to admire this slog. <laughs> and it's like, it's a, I was not completely off about that. Like it is um, quite dry and it's, it's like, like reading the Bible. Uh, especially in the beginning. But I was surprised by how engrossing certain parts of it actually are. And uh, I, I, the latter half I definitely like better than the first half where I start to see, you sort of see names and places that you recognize and you have more of like a, a sense for like what we're talking about here. Uh, I personally just like don't like mythology all that much, like of any kind. And this reads more like mythology, but I, I immensely respect it. And I'm really glad that I read it and I will probably dip into it again in the future. I think it's one that probably does benefit from several rereads so that, cause it's just like a barrage of words and names that you have almost no context for. So I think familiarizing yourself with those words and names would be very, very helpful because otherwise it is like drinking out of a fire hose. <laughs> so I'm glad I read it and I enjoyed it more than I thought I would, but I don't think it's like a super fun page turning book to read, but I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very glad that I read The Silmarillion. And those are all the books that I read in December. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about my thoughts and feelings. Whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times, but Saturday, so like and subscribe, join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.